overview of BG. So in this first part of the course, I'll give you really a very broad overview of what is in BG and uh, how we collect information there. And then we'll go into more technical details of some specifics of the database, okay? So, so first, as we already mentioned, BG is the work of a team. So it's not one person. And if you have any questions, we have this uh, email address, which goes to a ticketing system, which we reply to as rapidly as possible and goes to the right person inside the team. So you don't need to guess. Uh, we are on Twitter and Mastodon and we monitor these and also answer to replies to questions there. I should have put, we also answer to issues on GitHub, but most experimental badges users don't use that way to ask questions. This is the team. Last summer, there's been some change, so I put a more recent photo, although Chris Mangal here is not actually from the team. He's a, a great, very close collaborator and good friend of ours, but he's, this is otherwise the team in the recent back curation meeting in Padua, Italy. And so what does BG do? The, our goal with BG really is to help biologist users and to understand gene expression. So gene expression is a complex uh, trait. There are many aspects to gene expression, especially in multicellular organisms like animals. And so what we want to do is to make it easier for people to understand and use gene expression and to help biologists, whether experimental or computational, have the easiest access to this information. So everything we do is trying to fulfill these two goals. Can we understand better gene expression and can we make it useful to biologists? And so now I will do a quick demo, which is already always a bit dangerous, but let's try this. Just because the easiest way to show you what we do in BG is to go to BG. So, um, okay, Zoom has lost my, uh -huh, got it, uh, Firefox. Okay, so here you see the homepage of BG, uh, which you can access by typing www.bg.org, pretty clear. And here, what we see first is that we have a pretty big list of species, so 52 species, as Frédéric said. So in BG, we our goal is to integrate gene expression from animals. So we have only animal species, so no plants, no yeast, no bacteria. And in principle, we are... Uh, open to integrating any animal species, although of course there's always some uh, trade-offs to what data is available, what time we have and what priorities we have. But you see here the five classic model organisms of animals, humans, mouse, zebrafish, Drosophila melanogaster, and C. elegans, and then various animals of agronomic interest, and then various animals which represent different aspects of biodiversity. And if you go to our homepage, the first thing you can do is search for your favorite gene. So like if I look for insulin, I get here all the results from insulin in different species. And if I click on one, I see the expression in that gene. And that's what we do. We provide you gene expression, right? Um, and we also have on our homepage various tools, which we would present to you over the day to compare expression between species, to access the annotation, to express cause of expression, and to analyze enrichment of uh, gene expression. Uh, and we have here on the page, all the information that you might also need in various ways. So the more specialized access, the species of list with the information, which genome version we used, which uh, uh, source of the data, you can download our data. <clears throat> we have some more specialized uh, resources such as our packages, Spark at Endpoint, and we have information about our publications, the videos of this course and so on. So, all this information is there. I'll go back to my, and now I will start the first of my WooClub. Uh, so on the, on the page of the course, you have a link to, uh, or maybe share this so you see what you're doing. Yeah. So going back to this. So here, if you're on the page of the document, you see that here there's a link to activities. If you click on it, you get to a Google Doc, and here there's a WooClap link. And this WooClap link will actually be the same during all the courses. It's a tool to provide uh, interactions during courses, okay? 
And so I'm going to launch the first WooClub and it's just asking you to answer a very simple question, uh, whether we have information from these different, uh, different uh, species or data sources. So you have one minute to please vote on this. So you follow the link and you vote. Okay, so thank you for the votes. So um, you were all correct that there is a uh, fly and healthy human data. There is also platypus, this is important. We don't restrict ourselves to the classic model organism. We take, when there is sufficient data in a non-model species, which can be of interest to some evolutionary questions or some other biological questions, even biomedicals, like some fish are modeled for aging or whatever, then we take it in as much as there is a reference genome of high quality and there is sufficient expression data. So we have platypus, we have weird fishes, we have uh, amphioxus and various weird species. Also, we're in the Department of Ecology and Evolution, so that's interesting to us. We do not have yeast and we do not have arbidopsis, so BG is restricted to animals. And so this is not going to change. We, we are animal-centric. And this was a bit of a, a trap because I did not uh, yet speak about this, but we curate only healthy wild type data. So for human, for example, we do not have cancer data. So if you look into the database of gene expression where all the data is like geo and our express, you'll have a lot of cancer data for humans. It's most of the data actually. And we do not keep that data because what we want to show you is how the gene expression is in a standard normal state. So, Go back to my slides. There. And so what we do in BG is that I would, sorry, I just, there. Um, every time I change, I have to reset things. Okay, so we take gene expression from a diversity of sources. So ESTs, which is a very old fashioned way of getting expression, but we still have it. Affymetrics microarrays, which were the main way to get genome wide expression uh, 10 years ago. Bulk RNA seq, which was the main way in the last 10 years, and increasingly single cell RNA seq, which we'll hear a lot about this morning. And also in situ hybridization data. So, this is very precise data, usually one experiment at a time in, a, in, a, in an experiment, typically development of biology, but also sometimes in adults, especially in mouse. People are going to hybrid to, to take a transparent uh, embryo or do a cut through an organism, hybridize a marker for one gene and see exactly where the genes first express it in text. And this is then uh, curated, verified by these model organism database such as MGI for the mouse, ZFIN for the zebrafish, Flybase for Josephina and so on. And we do not do this curation, that's not our job, but we recover it in agreement with them and we keep only, again, the healthy wild type. And so all these data we have to process. So we do quality control, only take those which are healthy wild type. We process the data so that Affymetrix, rna seq bulk, and single cell all process the same way in a consistent manner. We standardize and map this to ontologies. All these terms will be explained over the morning. And we integrate all this together in BG. And I think this is really an important point. As far as we know, we're the only database where these different sources of information on gene expression are integrated together. They're not pre presented separately. You don't have to choose when you go to the BG page or use the BG tools whether you want to see from microarray or from bulk rna seq or from single cell rna seq or from in situ hybridization. We're going to give you all the information we can together. Now, I've spoken here about quality control, filtering, mapping. All this is part of bio curation, and BG is a curated database, and it's very important to 
understand this concept and what distinguishes a curated database from a non-curated database. So uncurated databases are very common and they have advantages and drawbacks, of course. So a typical example of an uncurated database all of you are probably uh, familiar with is what used to be called gene bank is now called NCBI nucleotides, where all the DNA sequences which were ever made public are all there. So because they're all there, even if 20 groups sequence the same gene, there's a huge redundancy because it only depends on the information that people put in without additional verification and without additional organization. There's a low organization of the knowledge. So you have whatever information someone put when they put it and nothing more. It has an added value, of course, that it can be complete and up to date because it's automatically generated. So uh, uh, gene bank or other nucleotide database up to date every 24 hours. A curated database is one where you have curators, human beings who are experts who verify all the information we should put into the database and organize it. And a typical example of a curated database is the Swiss prot part of Uniprot, which probably most of you are familiar with. And when you go there, the data are verified, there is minimal redundancy. So if different groups sequence the same protein or analyze the same proteins in the same it comes together into one entry. Annotations are standardized, so it's always the same term used for the same thing. And there's the added value is that the knowledge is organized and reliable, so it's much easier for you to recover it and you can trust it much more. And this is just a quote from the Bacuration Society, that Bacuration involves the translation and integration of information relevant to biology into a database or resource that enables integration of the scientific literature as well as large data sets. I think it's really important that it's the translation and integration of information. So the bio curators are doing this work for you of finding what is the relevant information, finding how it can be expressed in a way which can be manipulated by informatically and integrating it so that you have access to all this together. And so what is annotation? Annotation is associating a biological object to a feature, sorry, I have a, a window from Zoom which is blocking my slides, which is a bit annoying. I have to change this and I cannot, there, sorry. Yeah. Okay, associate a biological object to a feature based on evidence. Both of these parts are important. Associating a biological object to a feature, for example, associating a gene to a gene ontology term. And based on evidence, that is, we don't just associate them randomly, we have to know why we're associating them and we're going to document why we associate them. And you can have this, you can have this association, this annotation without curation. So if you give every uh, gene in a new genome, a gene ontology terms according to the first blast hit to another genome, that's uncurated annotation. You do not verify anything, you trust the automatic system. Whereas if you read, papers which describe functional assays on a gene. And from there you say, okay, according to these assays, the function is this or that. And you find the right gene ontology terms correspond to this function from the assay. And you put them to the gene, annotate them to the gene. That's curated annotation. That's what's done, for example, in SwissProt. And BG is a curated database. So all expression data in BG is verified. So we only take wild type healthy expression data and any data which does not fulfill those criteria is excluded. And then every expression data set is annotated by manual curation. So it's curated annotation. So we associate the expression data to what anatomical term it comes from, what age was the individual, what species and all this. And we read, we have curators whose job it is, who are professionals and read all the metadata which is submitted to GEO, RA Express, and so on, but also go to the paper, to the supplementary material of the paper, and in case where it's unclear, contact the authors, but we need to be certain of what we do. And we follow standards for the annotation, which terms we use, how we uh, control the, the confidence we have, and those annotations, those standards are also curated so as to have the highest possible uh, standards. And so now if we go to the Google Doc, um, so you have the link to the Google Doc in the in the activities, and here I'm going to ask you to each write two examples 
of curated databases you know of and of uncurated databases you know of. And there's a column participant name, but if you feel uncomfortable putting your name, you can just leave it empty. Someone asked where the Google Docs. So there's a link from the from the Word document of the course. So I can show you this. So here is the Word document, and if you click on this link, you arrive to this document. So we see here a diversity of types of databases, of course, sequence ones, but also various like Zphin or OMIM phenotypes, Plycide Atlas and Flybase. Plycide Atlas is gene expression single cell. Flybase is uh, like Zphin phenotypes, gene expression, many things of an organism. Uh, Peg pathways, GWAS catalog is a association between genes and phenotypes. So again, phenotypes. So I have to mention that MGI is curated in the same, it's a model organ database like uh, Flybase or Zephin. A geo, for example, is the equivalent of NCBI nucleotide, but for the gene expression data. So people put their microarray or RNA seq data there, and it is not verified. Okay, so we see a diversity here. I will go back to my slides. I'll find them in my. Okay, so as I told you, we only curate wild type healthy gene expression. And why do we do this? Because wild type gene expression, wild type healthy is informative on what we call the causal function of a gene. So if you want to know, if you ask what does a gene do, if I take the example of BRCA1, BRCA1, when it's mutated, you have increased your chances of breast cancer. But this is not the function of the gene. The function of the gene is not that any more than the function of your tire is to stop your car when it deflates, when it's punctured. The function of BRCA1 is what it does in wild type healthy individuals. And so that is what we want to capture. And it's evolutionary relevant because if you're comparing gene expression between human and zebra fish, you want to compare healthy wild type human zebra fish, not a sick human to a mutant knockout zebra fish. And so it's a, and it, provides a reference for biomedical studies. So we started from an evolutionary biology question, but actually we find that it is very useful for biomedical studies because often if you study gene expression in disease, in treatment and so on, you want to know what is the reference, how did this gene behave in a wild type healthy individual? And so this provides this reference. And to give you an example of what it means to do this curation, if I take the GTEC uh, data set, which was until the human cell, that's the largest data set for gene expression in humans, it's used by many people as a reference relative to diseases or other conditions. And it's, they say in their documentation, they were collected by from 54 non-disease tissue sites across nearly 1,000 individuals. But if you look at their documentation, they also say, 
we have not excluded specific donors from specific tissues based on their cause of death or medical history. So the curators of BG went over all the pathology reports and all the annotation of the GTEC data. And what we found is that in many cases, this was not healthy uh, individuals. So we have among the subjects which were uh, included in GTEC, we have 235, which indeed are healthy, but we have 179 for whom we rejected all data because, for example, they died of drug abuse, they died of cancer. Uh, and we have 158 for whom we rejected some tissues and kept others. So if you look at the samples here, we kept about half. And there are uh, individuals where we uh, discarded from the subject or discard just the sample because, for example, if you have someone who died with dementia, we would take the gene expression from the liver, the muscle, but not from the brain. If someone had a liver disease, we will take the brain, but not the liver and so on. And so, in fact, you see that in the end, we only kept half of GTEC samples. So when you use all GTEC, it is not curated. It is not wild type healthy. And in BG, we do this job so that you can be sure it is healthy. And so in total, we reviewed 12,000 libraries of RNA-seq and only kept a bit, almost 5,000. And then we annotated this to reference uh, standards, ontologies, with the anatomy, anatomy, the age, the sex, and the ethnicity. But because GTEC is from humans, which is, uh, partly confidential data, uh, we only show publicly in BG, the African entity, but a broad age range. So the destiny from which they are and not the ethnicity. And you can recover all this information following such a link where you have all the anatomy annotations we put on GTEC. And then we standardize the data. So what does that mean? For example, uh, that metadata about library, sorry, I have to change my mouse again to be able to do something. This is a bit annoying there. Um, so we standardize the metadata about library construction. For example, if you take RNA-seq, there can be strand selection, you should fold or revert to unstranded library types, fragmentation. All these features are going to change how you can analyze the data and what you can do with it. And we standardize this when you capture the data. And then we annotate a diversity of protocols of bulk RNA seq. So we have a classification of all the bulk protocols that we have encountered in annotating data, curating data for BG. And we have 40 protocols which are classified according to what can we do with them. Can we call genes? present if they're there but and absent if they're not there or if for example you specifically looked only for coding genes and you don't find non-coding gene that means it was absent from the sample but you didn't uh, recover it from the experiment if you have only three prime ends of rna then you don't need to uh, normalize by rna length because you do not sequence all the rna length and so on and so we have to adapt our protocol and when you recover the final process data we've already taken this into account and we do the same for single cell RNA seq, which I must say is a lot of work because single cell is much newer than bulk, and yet we already have 32 protocols. And almost every two weeks, we have a new protocol that we have to classify. They can there's different ways to isolate the cells, to isolate the RNA, <clears throat> to sequence uh, the RNA, to barcode it or not, to identify the cells. And right now we classify all those protocols, but we only keep in BG four protocols, SmartSec, SmartSec2, 10X chromium V2 and V3. And it actually makes eight because for each of these, we can accept single nuclei or single cell. And if we go back to the Google Doc now, you have a question. Uh, so here I put you a little uh, quiz um, asking you to uh, tell me what are the healthy wild type data from an experiment. So you can read the description and this is the kind of job our curators do. We have circadian course of liver mRNA profile of, wild, of WT BMAL1 liver co KO reverb, I, A, beta, liver double KO, cry one, cry two, double KO after 12 weeks of high fat 
diet feeding and li ad libitum or time restricted feeding? What would you keep here as healthy wild type? Uh, so we had a question about the EQTL analysis. So the answer for this will also depend on your personal access to uh, the uh, sensitive part of the data, because as far as I know, to run the EQTL analysis, you need to be able to associate the gene expression with the SNPs, which can only be done if you have full access to the individual information. But... Okay, so if I look at what you have been writing on the Google Doc here, there's some diversity. So something that none of this is um, you know, healthy wild type. Several of you uh, kept the WT annotation, which indeed means wild type. Some people also kept some of the knockouts. So no, none of the knockouts would be kept in BG because they are not wild type. So we don't keep either the cry one, cry two, double knockout, nor uh, the BMAL one liver knockout. Um, so those who think that nothing here is wild type have noted that there is a treatment. Indeed, there is high diet feeding ad libitum or time restricted feeding. And that is the kind of question we uh, have to address all the time when we curate data for BG. What is in fact wild type healthy? So if I give some mice more food and some mice less food, is this still a healthy environment? And this is a difficult question, which in this case, we consider that any feeding um, regime which could happen in nature will be considered within the normal biological variation. So we're going to accept the high fat diet and the time restricted feeding. And we are only going to accept the wild type. So we will take, and this is a circadian time course. So there will be points at different times over the day, samples over different times of the day where obviously gene expression will vary. But again, this is part of the natural variation of gene expression in the wild type healthy individual. So we will accept the different time points, we'll accept the two diets, but we will not accept the, the knockouts, simple or double. And these are the kinds of choices we have to make. And our aim is really to give you gene expression, which represents what you could find in nature, what has been in fact selected by natural selection over millions of years in these species. And so mice over the last uh, millions of years have lived by day and by night, have had sometimes more food, sometimes less food. So this is within their natural variation. But within their natural variation, they did not get a uh, liver-specific knockout of BMR1. Okay? So that's uh, our, our logic in these uh, annotations. And now that was the first part of the back curation, which is to choose the data we're going to use. But then we have to annotate this data to make it useful to you. And for this, we annotated to ontologies. So what is an ontology? An ontology in bioinformatics is a list of terms. So you agree which words you will use for what. So for example, you will say that for um, brain, you will use brain, or central nervous system, but you choose one term. 
And if you only have a list of terms, you have a control vocabulary, which is quite useful already. For example, the enzyme nomenclature is a, a control vocabulary. Then you have definitions of the terms. So if you have a list of terms with definitions, this is a dictionary, not only in our life outside biology, but also in bioinformatics and generally the management of knowledge in computer science. And now if we have relations between the terms, then we have an ontology. So what is relations between the terms? I'm not only saying I'm going to use the word cerebellum. I'm not only giving it a definition, but I'm saying the cerebellum is part of the brain. And now I have a relation between them. And there are various types of relations, and these allow automatic reasoning. What is automatic reasoning? Well, it's simply the fact that if I say I want all genes expressed in the brain, and there is a gene who has an annotation that it's expressed in cerebellum, then I can recover that gene because automatically I can know anything expressed in cerebellum is expressed in brain since the cerebellum is part of the brain. And the most well-known ontology that certainly you all know is the gene ontology. So the gene ontology has these different parts, right? It has uh, specific terms, they have definitions and they have relations between them. So cell migration in the hindbrain is, uh, is a cell migration and is a, and is a cell migration is part of hindbrain development. So you have different types of relations and all this cell migration, the hindbrain in the end is part of biological process, right? And these are used in all databases which want to annotate function of genes. For example, here you have an entry from Uniprot Swissprot from a whole milk box gene in zebrafish. And you have here these go terms with here cell migration and hindbrain, which was here. And we use other ontologies, ones which allow us to describe where and when a gene is expressed. And the main feature of where and when a gene is expressed in an animal is anatomy. So if I tell you this gene is expressed in a mouse or in zebrafish or in fly, you're going to know what does it mean expressed? Where is it expressed? Which organ? So we have here the ontology called Uberon, which is an ontology which describes the anatomy of any animal. And it's uh, so here you have, for example, the liver, and it includes within the ontology the fact that some organs or some terms you will only find in some groups of species. So here the liver is only in taxon vertebrates. So the liver of vertebrates is only in vertebrates. So within the same ontology that you also have the terms for, say, fly, but specifically here we can do an automated reasoning to say I should only recover liver if I have a vertebrate. And then you have the same part of relations you had for, oops, sorry, for the gene ontology. And you also have other relations I should develop from, contributes to the morphology of, part of, and so on. And so we have all this description, which is quite complex, of the anatomy of an animal. And this we use to annotate the gene expression we find to the specific, as specific as possible terms in anatomical ontology in your brain. So as specific as possible means that if someone tells us this is the uh, uh, lobe of the liver, we'll be specific lobe of the liver. But if they say, I took this from the head without saying whether it's the brain, the eyes, whatever, we're going to call it the head. And we have these more specific terms, like here you see abdomen, and these less, less specific terms, sorry, these more specific terms like liver here or hepatobiliary system. So here, a little WUKLAP. We'll see if you've been following this. Um, so you go to WUKLAP, and I'm going to start a new one. I have actually two WUKLAPs here. Sorry, this is the wrong one. So quitting, yeah. So about ontologies. So about anatomy annotation to ontology. Can you tell me in an experiment which has RNA seq from six organs across ten species of mammals and birds, how many different uberon identifiers? So specific terms in uberon ontology of anatomy should be used for the annotation of this gene expression. So the WUCLAP link is the same as previously. I have one vote. It's a very close race between two votes. Uh, all options have been cho chosen now.
So a majority voted for 60, which is six times 10. And this is not the correct answer because the fact we use one ontology which covers the anatomy of any species of animals, these are the same six organs, the homologous six organs across mammals and birds. We can use the same Uberon ID. So you use the same Uberon identifier to recover the liver of a human, a mouse, a chimpanzee, or a chicken. So we only need six for this. And this way it's standardized and you can recover easily the gene expression from the same organs and different species. Okay. And so rapidly, what makes this, these ontologies useful is that they are used by many resources. So we have one common standard. So you know the gene ontology is used in many databases, but Uberon is used, is common to all animal species and used in all the big projects and many small projects, annotating expression or other features of uh, biology which are relevant to anatomy. For example, GTEC annotates to Uberon, the human cell atlas annotates to Uberon, the fly cell atlas annotates to Uberon. It covers a large domain of knowledge, so all animal anatomy. And what makes an ontology useful is that there are tools leveraging it. And I think we are the main provider of tools for Uberon, and you will see this later today. And we also have to use increasingly the cell ontology because we have single cell data. And so just describing organs and tissues is not sufficient. The cell, cell ontology describes cell types, and it is, again, a similar uh, structure as what you saw for the gene ontology or Uberon. You have terms with definitions and relations. So a Kupfer cell is located in tissue-specific uh, macrophage. It is part of erythrocyte clearance and so on. Now, there are some challenges for this because organs are suddenly well known for centuries and it is pretty well described. S single cell RNA seq is making us learn a lot about cell types. And so we often get new cell types or specific cell types described in uh, single cell RNA seq, which were not yet described in the cell ontology. So, for example, from the fly cell atlas, we get cell types of T neurons, T4A, T4B, T5A, and T5B. But these types are not in the cell ontology. So, we had to annotate them all to a parent term, adult cholinergic neuron, which is a type of neuron which includes all these T4A, B, T5, A, and B, but don't include other T neurons. So we keep it as specific as possible. We don't just say neuron, but we cannot have the, de the granularity, the level of detail of the original experiment because it's not yet in the cell ontology. So that's something we're working on together with other uh, groups who work on the organization of information for cell uh, single cell gene expression to improve this. And we constantly require new cell type terms because new cell types are discovered simply. And so, for example, we have the distinction between octo octopaninergic neuron and tyraminergic neuron, which is not yet in the cell ontology either. So, for example, when we curated the, we are curating right now the fly cell atlas, and we found some errors which we had to correct, a bit like for GTEC. Uh, so, for example, the male reproductive system was reported with two different identifiers. It should have only one, should be consistent. And sometimes there are obviously errors because we find ovary cell annotated in a male or testis in a female. So clearly there was some error in reporting here. And sometimes we find that the cell type, where there should be the cell type, they report an uh, organ or a tissue and adult hindgut is not obviously a cell type. So we have to go back over this and recurate it systematically. And we've curated a lot of the supply cell atlas, all the public data in BG. And it is available through this link. We have curated uh, 61 libraries, uh, 1,500 conditions, and we have obtained 27 million processed expression values. And overall, what do we annotate to in BG? We annotate to anatomical entity and cell type, what I just described, but we also have separate ontology for development and life stages. So all the embryonic development, but also aging and post-embryonic uh, development, such as metamorphosis in species where there is sex, male, female, undefined, and sometimes there's hermaphrodite, like in C. elegans, and strains or populations if we have this information. And so one 
information of expression in BG is going to be a gene and a species with all this information of anatomy, cell type, life stage, sex, and strain. And so this is an example of annotation where from the paper, from the, the metadata in the public database, you have polyar RNA-seq and embryonic day 12.5 mouse gut from three wild type male, three wild type females. So we structure this so you have a specific term uh, antistine with the Ubron idea. You have a stage of the mouse which corresponds to 12.5 day with an identifier. You have the strain which is specified here with not written, but if you go back to the paper, you can find it and so on. And so this is the end of the overview part. So we put together curation of data and integration, which you'll get more information about later. We allow to compare between uh, species and all this comes together into BG. And so I see one question in the... Uh, so Frédéric wanted to add some uh, uh, specificity to what I said. No, oh, yeah, it was just a small mistake that those different neuron types you mentioned, it's not that they were not in the cell ontology, it's that from the single cell data, they could not identify clearly which of these four neuron types it was. So they provided the four annotations, but in BG, it doesn't work. We cannot have incertainties about the annotation. So we map to the common parent describing these four neuron types.